In this video, we revisit the A-star pathfinding algorithm and just look at a few concepts in a bit more detail. So clearly, as this video goes over material already covered in our previous A-star pathfinding algorithm and directly addresses some of the most common misconceptions, you should have watched our previous video first. So we're going to take another look at the A-star pathfinding algorithm and consider a situation where we've reached the goal vertex, but not yet found the most optimal route. At the end of the last video, we discovered the goal vertex L and we'd found a route, A-D-E-H-M-L. And we said it was a common misconception that the algorithm stopped at that point. In reality, we need to carry on considering unvisited vertices connected to L until such time as L has been marked as visited. Now, in our previous example, nothing changed. We had, in fact, already found our most optimal route. So let's consider this much simpler graph. We've populated the table, we've calculated heuristics, and we've set all the initial starting G and F values. We begin with the starting vertex A and consider each connected vertex that's not yet been visited. So that's B, C and D. So we can see that vertex B's G value is zero, that's A's distance from the start, plus the edge value of five is five. Therefore its F value is five, plus its heuristic of four equals nine. This F value is lower than the one that was previously stored in the table of infinity. So we update the F value for B and also set the previous vertex to A. In a similar way, when we calculate the F values of C and D, we find that their values are lower than the ones they were storing, so we update the table in a similar way. Vertex A has now been visited, so we update the table to reflect this. We search for an unvisited vertex with the lowest F value. Well, that's D with an F value currently of three. We consider each connected vertex that's not been visited. Well, that's just E. So we need to calculate E's F value. Well, that's the G value, which is D's distance from start of two, plus the edge value of three, that's five, plus the heuristic of zero. So that gives us an F value of five. That's lower than what's already stored. So we update the table. Vertex D has been visited. So we update the table to reflect this. Now at this point, we've found the goal vertex of E and we've discovered a root, A, D, E. However, as E has not been marked as visited yet, the algorithm should not stop here. We can see that E still has two vertices connected to it that have not been visited. So it's possible there's a more optimal route yet to be discovered. And this is the point where a lot of textbooks and online resources make the mistake of stopping. So let's follow the algorithm through until E has been visited and see if we can find a better route than the one already discovered. So we simply search for an unvisited vertex with the lowest F value. Well, that's currently C with an F value of four. We consider each connected vertex that has not been visited. And that's E. So we need to calculate once more the F value for E. So that's the G value. So that's the value for G at C of two, plus the edge value of two gives us a new G value of four, plus the heuristic of zero, giving us an F value for E of four. Well, the newly calculated F value of four is lower than the one we were currently storing of five. So this time we update the F value of E down to four, and at the same time, update the previous vertex to show that we've now come from C. Vertex C has now been visited, so we can update the table to reflect this. By continuing the algorithm and considering vertex C, we have found a more optimal route, A, C, E. However, as E has still not been marked as visited, we cannot stop here either. It's still possible for there to be a more optimal route. 
So we search for an unvisited vertex with the lowest f value. Again, of course, that's E with a value of four. And we consider each vertex that's not been visited that's connected to it. Well, that's B. So we recalculate the f value for B. So that's E's G value of four plus B's distance from the start of five gives us nine plus the existing heuristic of four. So nine plus four gives us 13. Well, the newly calculated F value of 13 is clearly higher than the one we're currently storing of nine. So there's no need to update the table at this point. Vertex E has now been visited. So we update the table to reflect this. At this stage, we have now found the goal vertex, considered all its adjacent vertices. So now the goal is marked as visited. We can say for sure that there are no shorter routes available. The shortest path, therefore, from A to E is ACE. If we'd stopped the algorithm as soon as we'd found the goal, we may have wrongly assumed the shortest path was ADE. Comparing A star to Dijkstra's, you'll notice that node B was never marked as visited. And this point illustrates how using the A star pathfinding algorithm with a heuristic can be more efficient. So having watched this video, you should be able to answer the following key question. Under what circumstances does the A star pathfinding algorithm terminate? So that's everything you need to know about the A star algorithm for the exam. But if you've got another couple of minutes, we're going to go slightly beyond the spec and just cover some real interesting applications of the algorithm. So when searching on the internet for the A star pathfinding algorithm, you'll often come across animations such as the one shown on the screen now. Images like this one can sometimes add to the confusion of how the algorithm really works. What underlying data is being used to create this sort of visualization? It can't be any of the graph structures we've shown you so far. So what is actually going on? Well, the answer is surprisingly simple. We know that pathfinding algorithms like the A star and Dijkstra's work on graphs. To use them on a grid, we simply represent the grid with a graph. Take the example of the map from the previous video. In this illustration, we would use a graph where every reachable white, white square, e.g. not a wall, becomes a node or vertex. Now this may seem like a lot of unnecessary data, but with an admissible heuristic, the majority of the graph will not be traversed in order to find the most optimal route. For now, we'll focus on the bottom left corner of the map. Let's assume we need to find the most optimal route from the green node in the bottom left to the other green node towards the top right. As we now understand that every square on the grid is being stored as a node, and the valid routes between the grids or squares, the edges, are directly up, down, left or right, we can simplify the illustration. We can see here how Dijkstra's algorithm has calculated the distance from the start node, bottom left, to every other node. The numbers here are the G values. By following the numbered path, we can find the quickest route from the start node to the end node. But the algorithm has reached out to all the other nodes as well. Compare this with the A star algorithm where a heuristic has been used to estimate the distance of the goal. These numbers are the F values. The A star algorithm uses the heuristic to reorder the nodes, so it's more likely the goal node will be encountered sooner. The obvious advantage is that the A star algorithm uses the heuristic and this expanding frontier or fringe to ensure it doesn't explore nodes in an unnecessary direction. The lighter coloured cells represent the fringe or frontier, and the white cells are nodes that are never visited. Although most grid-based maps are represented with graphs, you will never see something like this, for example, in the exam. 
what you will see, a graph like this. So this graph is actually a pre-optimization of the graph data structure and is used for performance reasons. Because of course, in general, the fewer nodes that the A star algorithm needs to process, the faster it's going to run. So while this is all outside the scope of the A level, if you're interested in learning more about reducing graph size for optimization, you could look up techniques such as waypoints, navigation methods, hierarchical approaches and quad trees. Incidentally, the approach that we've been using in this video is that of waypoints. We know that getting to grips with data structures and all the algorithms associated with them is a very tricky area of the course. And so we've produced a book called Essential Algorithms for A-Level Computer Science that's available on Amazon. It covers all the data structures you need to know about, along with the algorithms you need to perform on them, and it covers all the exam boards. We overview each data structure, discussing its typical applications and the operations you can perform on it. We provide a QR code that jumps off to a useful page of additional resources. We then take each data structure and the algorithms you need to perform and present them first in simple structured English, then in a diagrammatic format, then in pseudocode, and finally we present you with fully coded algorithms which you need to cover on the data structures in both Python and VB so you can actually code them up and practice them yourselves.